In the first video, we added the player and the animation and collision for the player. So now let's proceed to uh, add some code to move this guy. Back to the uh, Godot tutorial, I'm down at coding the player section. Here we're gonna add the movement, play the animation and uh, set up the collision detection code. So to do this, we're gonna select the player and add a script to it. Let's go back to the editor with the player selected attach a script, leave it at GD script. The player is an area 2D, so this inherit is good. So we can leave everything as is. Our script player.gd is going to be under the player folder. It'll be right here. Now make sure you're on the script tab and over here on the left panel, make sure player.gd is selected. So this is the boilerplate code that it gives us. We'll start by adding these two variables to the code right here under the extends area 2D. So we're declaring the speeds variable. The player is going to move at 400 pixels per second. And then we want a variable to store the size of the game window, which was 480 by 720. This export here makes it so that the speed variable shows up on the inspector when you have the player node selected. So if I take out export and then save, you can see that it's gone from here. Let me add it back. Here it is. This is useful when we're testing. We can play the scene and then adjust the speed in the editor and watch the speed of the player change. So this 400 starting number is totally arbitrary. If we don't really know how fast we want the player to move, having this attribute here, it's useful. We can play the scene and then adjust this number as the scene is running. And then we can see if we like how fast it's moving. So whatever you put here will overwrite what's in this variable. So keep that in mind. The player code already comes with a ready and a process function. The ready function is called once when the player is created in the game. And then the process function is called every frame of the game. Now in the ready function, we can grab the size of the screen. This is something that we'll use later. We get rid of this pass placeholder at the screen size here. Now in the process function, we'll check for input from a keyboard, mouse, controller, whatever. We'll move the player and then we'll play the appropriate animation. Now let's set up the input under project, project settings, and then the input map tab. We can add the mapping for the movements. Player, project settings, input map. Here, click on add new action. You want to move to the right. Click on add or hit enter. Now that this entry is here, we can click on this plus button with the cursor blinking on listen for input. We can hit the right arrow key on the keyboard and it will detect that we hit the arrow key and then we can hit OK. And now we have mapped the right arrow key to the move right action. We can add more than one mapping. So if we want to do uh, WASD as the movement keys, I can add D here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and add the rest of the um, directions quickly. All right, so I'm just gonna use the arrows. I'm gonna get rid of the D key here. All right, our mapping is done. Now that we have mapped the keys, we want to be able to process those keys. We'll do that in the process function. Let me copy this and go over to the process function and paste it in. Make sure the indents are lined up. Godot uses vectors for movement. If your vector math is rusty, it's uh, worthwhile to spend some time reviewing the material here. It's not that very long, but definitely very helpful for you to understand what's going on. Okay, let's take a look at what the code is doing. We're declaring a velocity vector, a 2D vector, 
and uh, initializing it to zero. And then we're detecting input here. It's possible to hit each one of those keys individually. So it's possible to move diagonal if you hold down the left and down arrow. So this is pretty straightforward. It's just adding or subtracting a one to the, um, or the X or Y axis. Now down here, it's checking for velocity.length. If it's greater than zero, we do something what is length so i'm going to hold down the control key and then you see this underline the word length is underlined i'll click on it it brings up the documentation length returns the magnitude of the vector okay if the magnitude is greater than zero that means we pressed some key we'll multiply the velocity by the speed that was defined up here now why call the normalize function this is in case the input is diagonal. Let's say we're moving left and down. So when you hold down the left key, you get a vector going this way. When you hold down the right down key, you get a vector going down. Now, when you add the two together, notice that the magnitude is greater than one. That means if you hold down left and down, you're going to move faster than if you're just moving in the horizontal or vertical axis, and that's not what we want. By calling the normalize function, we make sure that the vector stays as one. So something like this. Now we wanna play the animation that was set up in Animate 2D. So we're playing this animation. Which one will we play? Uh, I think we're gonna add some code later on to choose the right one. This is a shorthand to get the Animate Sprite 2D object using the dollar sign symbol. So this text right here, it must match the name of this object on the left here. And that is explained right here. The dollar sign is a shorthand for get node. So dollar sign animates by 2D dot play is equivalent to get node, the name of the node dot play. Now we're gonna use the clamp function to make sure the character doesn't go off screen. Let me copy this. with the velocity. So velocity is in pixels per second. Delta is how much time that has passed between the last frame and the current frame. So if you multiplied delta, which is in seconds, you're gonna get the number of pixels to add to the current position. If one second has passed between the last frame and the current frame, will move 400 pixels. If it's one tenth of a second that has passed since the last frame, then we'll move 40 pixels. So Delta really depends what kind of uh, graphics card and CPU system, uh, system that you have. Now that we have the new position of the character, we're gonna make sure that it doesn't go off screen. We can do that using the clamp function, passing in the min, min and max. So let me go to here. Vector.0 is at the origin, 0, 0. That's the minimum. And screen size. Screen size is 480, 720. So at this point, so with the min and the max, we can make sure that the character doesn't go off screen. We can test that right now. I'm gonna click on one current scene. Now I'm gonna push left, right, up, down. And uh, let's make sure it doesn't go off screen. Okay. All right. Now playing the right animation. Let's grab this and go back to our code. Let's go to the bottom. Make sure the indents are correct. We'll check if we are moving horizontally. If we are moving horizontally, we'll choose the walk animation. Reminder, uh, if I click away and click back and animate it right 2D, you can see the two sets of animation here. If we're moving horizontally, we'll choose the walk animation. This is saying that we don't want to flip the uh, sprite vertically. We'll keep it like this when it's walking left and right. Now this determines if we want to flip this horizontally, which means the eyeball goes on the left side. So how this works is it this code is evaluated first. If X is less than zero, that's going to return true or false. Depending on that, it's going to flip the animation. And then when the player moves vertically, we're going to use the up animation. And we'll use the same logic as above to determine if we want to flip this guy to face down 
or not. Okay, let's try it out. Swimming up, swimming down, left eyeball, notice the eyeball. Cool. Okay, our movement is working correctly. Uh, the last thing we should do is to hide the player. Once we create the main scene, we're going to use the main scene to create the player. So after testing, we don't need to show the player. We'll call the hide function here under ready. Now to set up hit detection, we'll grab this custom signal here. This signal is going to be emitted or sent out when we detect a collision with the enemy. We'll go back to the player.gd script and add that here. And then that should show up on the note tab. But make sure you have the player selected. Now you see the new signal added here. What happens when the enemy intercepts the player space? It's going to automatically emit the body enter signal. So it's going to be body entered. Let me double click this. This is how we connect the signal to a function in the script. Godot has already created a name for us. So when you click on the connect button in player.gd, you can see that this new function is automatically created for us. You can see that there's a green symbol here. When you click on that, you can see that it's attached to the body enter signal. It's also shown on here. So these are built in functions that will automatically trigger when a collision is detected. And then it's going to kick off this function. Now inside this function, When the player is hit, the player disappears. We also want to send out the hit signal, the custom hit signal that we created here. We're going to emit that. And then later on, we're going to use the main scene to catch this signal. So the main scene can reset the game and do other cleanups. Now when the enemy and the player is intersecting, it's going to keep generating signals. So it's going to be repeatedly calling this function and we don't want that to keep happening. So this function here, using the dollar sign notation, we select the collision shape to the object. And then we want to set this able to true to stop the collision detection from happening. So there's an explanation here. Disabling the collision in the middle of a frame can cause errors. Using set defer, we can disable the collision detection at the end of the frame. So this is the safe way to do it. Now the last thing to add to the player code is this function. Let's copy it first. The start function is going to be called in the future by the main scene to start the player at a certain starting point. Make sure the player is showing on the screen. And also this is enabling collision detection again. So this is a double negative. So it's setting collision detection to be on again. All right, let's, uh, let's play the scene again. Remember, we changed the code to hide the player. So now the player doesn't show up anymore. So this is expected, you're going to get a blank screen. All right, we finished the code for the player. Uh, the next one is creating the enemy. So uh, I'll see you in the next video.